Hey, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? All right. Hey, we're going to get started here in a minute. Hey, who was here this morning? Here. That was it? There was just one person in here this morning? Well, yeah, but isn't there some Sam students in here now, too? Okay. Anyways, this is completely different from this morning. So if you're here this, this morning and you're back here now, you're not missing anything. This is going to be a completely different pitch. But anyways, I'd like to introduce somebody here in just a moment. Um, for, for those of you that don't know him, a uh, 30-year career Army officer, uh, armor and cavalry officer, um, served his, uh, his country uh, very, very well, uh, served at all levels from platoon to regiment, uh, worked uh, multinational jobs, has been in Korea, Europe, all over the world, uh, master combat trainer and master tactician. Uh, he's written several books, uh, not only for the military, but, but after the military. And um, what, what I'd like to say about Mr. Antal here is that he is just so passionate and so energetic about what he does um, that you'll, you'll feel his energy when he speaks. Um, and he, he has a passion to make sure that the people in this room, and the people that are still in the Army, Number one, don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And number two, that when we do go into combat in the future, we're ready and we're armed with the latest of what's going on in the world. Now, his most recent research over the last couple of years has been on the changing character of war, at the speed that war is changing, at the speed that technology is changing warfare, uh, especially with respect to Nagorno-Karabakh, his, his book, Seven Seconds to Die, and uh, this book here, which is uh, a body of work that focuses on that, the 2021 20, uh, Israel-Gaza incursion and what we've learned from the Ukraine so far. Um, so he's got some really interesting insights into why that is and what's happening and, and the speed at which we need to change. Um, he's written over 15 books. Um, he's involved in several uh, editorials. He's written hundreds of articles. He's on uh, boards for, uh, for all kinds of companies, software companies, gaming companies, uh, military journal and professional journals. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, his first book that he ever wrote, 1991, was a a book called Armor Attacks, the Tank Platoon. Um, and I, I hate that I'm going to admit this right now, but in 1994, when I was a second lieutenant, and I got to my first unit, I was required to read two books. And number one was Armor Attacks by, uh, by John Antel, and the other one was uh, one called Battle 73 Easting, which was written by H.R. Uh, McMaster at the time. But uh, it's my great honor to introduce a, a legend in the armor community, a legend in the maneuver community, and uh, someone who I'm very, very blessed to call a very good friend of mine, uh, Colonel Retired John Antel. Thank you, Sam. Very kind of you, Sam. My name is John Antel. My purpose in life is to develop leaders and inspire service. To develop leaders and inspire service. What is your purpose? Today I want to talk with you about the changing methods of war. And I believe that if you focus on this presentation and you pay attention to what I'm saying, you may find one or two diamonds in here from this presentation you can put in your pocket that you can use later to win, save lives, and make sure that we don't get hit in the face with a sledgehammer. The methods of war are changing. Look at that guy. That is the Ukrainian drone operator, FPV, first person view drone operator. That's what warfare looks like now. That's a uniform. He is looking through his VR goggles and he is controlling that drone as if he was the drone. And he sees what the drone sees and feels kind of what the drone feels when he goes through the air and the thing moves a little bit. It's amazing. How many drone operators do you have in your units? When the tooth is found to be alive and know the joy within you dies, don't you? That one scene of the Russian commander on the BMP as the kamikaze, kamikaze drone is coming at him, 
and he's trying to shoot it with whatever weapon he had there before it hits him and kills him. That's iconic of what's going on right now in Ukraine. Thousands of drones are being used every month by the Ukrainians. But it's not all about drones. It's about the changing methods of war. Drones are just one part of that. You need to get ready now. The history of failure in war, according to Douglas MacArthur, are the words too late, preparing too late, thinking too late, getting ready too late. We need to gain foresight. Foresight is the ability to solve problems in the short term and create solutions for the long run. We need leaders with foresight. We don't want to be too late. Now, there are a lot of indicators that war is imminent. Nobody knows. And you can argue out of it very easily. We can very easily say, oh, the Russians would never do that, the Chinese would never do that, the Iranians would never do that. But that's not your job. Your job is to win our nation's wars. And that means we have to case the worst case. We have to think about what would happen if it happened. And not whether it will happen in some mystical time of 2030 or 2035, but what if it happens tomorrow? Because tomorrow we could be at war with Iran. Or for that matter, by mistake or design, we could be at war with Russia. And the same goes for China. And North Korea has always been on the razor's edge, being able to launch weapons at American forces any time. And again, you can talk your way out of all of these. But now we need to think about how to apply the changing methods of war so that if war happens, we are very hard to kill. Because right now, we have too many situations where we are easy prey. We have, for instance, the Russians saying that they're at war with us. And in fact, we are in a hybrid war with Russia. You know this. And you say, no, we're not. Trust me. If your soldiers were being killed by HIMARS made in the United States of America, you know who the enemy is. We're in a hybrid war right now with Russia. And we have we have the Secretary of the Army saying that if China decides to move, we could be at war with China. And we have the Chinese saying that if you don't listen to us, you'll be in trouble. The British chief of staff, the commander of the British forces, said this. He said, last year, he said, this is our 1937 moment. Now, you see, the Europeans, they believe World War II started in 1939 with the invasion of Poland, right? Many of us would say, yeah, that's when World War II started. Americans pretty much think World War II started on December 7th, 1941. If you were Chinese, you might say in Manchuria in 1936. So it's interesting, when wars start, are we in a war now? Are we in a major buildup now? Imagine if it was now October 1941. And you knew with certainty, you knew with certainty that on December 7th, America would be at war against the Japanese. Now, other than telling to everybody what would, what would happen if you couldn't do that, but you could, have, you could just change what you could do with your unit, what would you do differently between now and then? What skills and things would you be practicing now that you're not doing? And then the question is, why aren't you doing those? Because we don't know when the war will start. So how do we prioritize what's necessary and get it done? And I know there's all sorts of problems, and everyone can tell you why you can't do this and you can't do that. And I, always, and I say over and over again, stop saying what you can't do. Tell me what you can do and work on it. Leadership matters. He said that a year ago. And this is what Gen uh, Admiral uh, Charles uh, Richard said. He said this Ukrainian thing, that's just a warm-up. The big one's coming. And what he was talking about was the rise of China and the Pacific. But he could just as easily have said the Middle East could be an issue. Now, strange things happen. You know the story of World War I. Who knows what this is? Right, Archduke Ferdinand. So, 
Logical progression makes all the sense in the world. The Austrian Archduke goes to Serbia, gets killed by a, a fanatic who is an anarchist, who belongs to no one. The Austrians declare war on Serbia. Serbia surrenders and says, we don't want war. We didn't shoot this guy. The Austrians say, we don't care. We're attacking you anyway. The Russians say, you can't attack our cousins, the Serbians. We'll declare war on you, and they do. The Germans say, you can't declare war on our cousins, the Austrians. We are declaring war on you, and therefore, Germany invades France. <laughs> so, stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. We have to be ready. Think about it. There are three or four uh, threat challenges that you all know about. You need to study these. You all need to be experts on the Russian army, the Chinese army, military, the North Korean military, and the Iranian military. If you can't be an expert on all of them, pick your flavor. But as an officer and a leader, as a leader, no matter what you're doing, we need to know about our enemies. We need to get out of our safety bubble here and start thinking about who they are. We have enough that is written on these folks that you, in fact, can learn about them. If you don't know how the Chinese fight, why not? We pay you to know that. And you go, oh, well, I got a lot of things to do. Yeah, you do. You have a lot of things to do. And these are four things that you need to do. You need to know about these. You need to be able to fight red team as the enemy, as the Chinese would fight, as the North Koreans would fight, as the Russians would fight. And their doctrines always change like ours do. So you need to stay up with it. Now there are four wars you need to study. And you need to be expert on these four wars because we pay you to do this. You need to know about the Second Nagorno Karabakh War. The war that happened in 2020 that lasted 44 days and decisive victory between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Azerbaijan won a decisive victory in 44 days. For that reason alone, you should study it. It was a joint, multi-domain campaign. For that reason alone, you should study it. And it was the first war in the history of humankind to be won primarily by robotic systems. Wow. How come you don't know that? Or do you know that? And if you do, are you studying it? Because there's lessons that we can learn from that war still. And they're playing out today in Ukraine, and they will play out in Gaza and other places. The next war, the Israeli-Hamas War of 2021, 11 days. In this war, the Israelis fought Hamas differently than they're fighting now. It was mostly a rocket campaign, but there was a lot of in, in interesting deception and other things that occurred. And it was the first war in history primarily won by artificial intelligence. Wow. Why didn't you know that? The first war in history primarily won by artificial intelligence. Worth studying. The next war, the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war. If you wanted to give one word to the Ukrainian method of war, it would be innovation. These guys adapt, improvise, and overcome. This fight needs to be studied, and you need to have case studies of the different battles. And I know in SAMS they're doing some of that, but particularly in CAC-T, we need to have the case studies of what's going on in the Ukrainian war and get those out to everybody and, and let them look at it and read it, because a lot of them won't do their own research. But it's all available, and most of it's open source. Yes, there's some other stuff that's secret that's wonderful to know, but you can learn a lot with open source. Everything I'm telling you is open source. There's more than enough open source material to write about. And then lastly, the, the recent war now between Hamas and Israel, and then soon Hezbollah, and then soon Iran. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, I don't have a crystal ball. Those people who say they do, they, they like to say usually eat crushed glass. My point is, is I don't care about, you know, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but I will tell you that the methods of war that are going to be used we can learn from these four conflicts. And those methods are important for you to study and understand. And if you don't study them, who will? The second are going to Karabakh War. Imagine if these were your soldiers.
Azerbaijan striking Armenian troops with loitering munitions. Armenia held the high ground. They had 26 years to prepare. We're not talking hills, we're talking mountains. It didn't matter. There are no sanctuaries. Everywhere in the battle space can be seen and hit. The battle space is transparent. But it's not just drones. It's not just loitering munitions. It's also a whole connected system of new weapons that are coming out that can talk to each other and can send back streaming video, even anti-tank guided missiles. This is what the screen of an Azerbaijani ATGM gunner, Spike LR, was looking at. Now what does he get from that? Three things. He knows he hit the target, and that spike went through that turret of that T-72, and it went 50, 50 feet in the air and killed anybody inside. Second thing, as that missile was flying through the air, you see the battle space. And you can go frame by frame and look at it with humans, or you can get AI to, to look at it, and you can find where every target is underneath it and get ready to shoot those. And third, you now have information, ammunition, if you will, for the information war. This was played on Armenian social media the night after this attack. And every one of these videos that you saw earlier than that were shown on Armenian social media by Azerbaijan. So Armenians were looking at this, trying to find out if their sons had been killed in the fight. Absolutely demoralizing, only showing Azerbaijani victories, because the loitering munition only, you know, shows, they don't show you any loitering munitions that miss the target, and some do, many do probably. The, the percentage rate is still up in the air depending on which which uh, unit you're looking at. But in the Second Dagona Karabakh War, that was the tipping point for Armenia. They were totally demoralized, and the information war piece was an added value to Azerbaijan. One Armenian soldier said this probably the most demoralizing statement you could ever make Nowhere to hide, day or night. No way to fight back. How are we going to fight back against loitering munitions? Your drone gun won't take down a loitering munition in most cases. How are we going to take them out? We have to knock them out of the sky. Loitering munition will loiter, some of them for six hours, some of them for 12 hours in, in, a, in a pattern. See its targeting parameters and then dive straight down and destroy that target as per its targeting parameters. The Azerbaijanis had top of the line Israeli made loitering munitions, the Harup and the Orbiter. These talk to each other. When they attack, they hit positions, and no loitering munition hits the same target twice. Once a target is hit, the word goes out across the network of the other loitering munitions. It's gone, and it goes to the next one. Armenian artillery was destroyed. Batteries were destroyed in, 30, in 30 seconds. You would see all six guns destroyed, or eight guns destroyed, depending on the size of the battery. And they were out in the open in most cases, or dug in not thinking the attack was coming from the top. And all of you know that top attack is one of the most preferred methods of war, which we'll talk about, and so therefore you always fly small UAS above your formations to make sure that you have camouflage and everything else from the top, don't you? Then the Israeli-Hamas War of 2021. What the Israeli Defense Forces did was they set up a trap for the Hamas. This is one of the reasons that Hamas is so angry now and had their recent attack, which they did so brilliantly and savagely. In this war, Israel moved its forces to the border, said we're going to attack, we're going to attack, sent fake messages to the Hamas uh, leadership. The Hamas leadership went down into the tunnels in the metro. The Israelis followed them. 
the AI collected everything, and in the right time with the right weapons, they were able to launch and destroy most of them in their bunkers. Pretty impressive. After 11 days, Hamas wanted a ceasefire. Maybe because they had a longer term view, who knows? Now we know about the attack that happened on October 7th. But this war is worthy of study, particularly now in giving you ideas about how the Israelis will uh, conduct combat operations in the future. And then of course the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war. And again, I, what I recommend is pick three, four, five, six case studies and study those in depth and get the information from them. Volidar is one of them. This is one where the Russians lost a tremendous amount of armored vehicles. The Ukrainians were very smart. They set up a minefield system, but they had lanes through the mines. The Russians found the open, openings and said, oh, these Ukrainians aren't very smart. They left these lanes in the minefield. Okay, they all went into the lanes, drove fast, got in there, fire sack, all destroyed with artillery. Those that tried to get out were then killed by fast cam, which of course we gave them, scatterable mines from artillery. That battle is one battle worth looking at, but there are many others. These guys trying to escape, they're hitting mines, they're getting hit with loitering munitions, they're getting hit with artillery. Now, the Ukrainians have made drone warfare an art. They didn't have any drones in their army until the war started. Not many. Not like this. He's saying he's dropping grenades on the high-value targets. None of these guys were soldiers prior to the war. They, they worked in the IT industry. They worked in different things. They've taken on now this drone task. Ukrainians lose thousands of drones every month. Some say as high as 10,000. That includes loitering munitions and other, other drones. 10,000 a month. That grenades from World War II. but they have to hide as well. So you can't stay in any one position too long. Now the Russians have lost a tremendous amount of brain power in this war because they've collected it in places called command posts. And some of those command posts were in tents because tents protect you from the rain, but not from anything else. And therefore, the casualties have been amazing. What does it take to reconstitute a core headquarters if it's destroyed? Yeah. What does it take to reconstitute a division main or a division tack if it's destroyed? 
What about a brigade CP, a battalion CP? We have got to work now to try to avoid being destroyed because being reconstituted is very, very difficult. How many years does it take to train the officers and the skilled technicians and the NCOs that operate these <coughs> command posts? We have got to change our thinking. And we are, but we're, cha we're changing a bit too slow. And we still believe we have a range differential, that if we're out of the range of the guns, we're going to be OK. You are never out of the range of the guns now in modern combat. They will hit you anywhere in Europe if they want, if, we, if the Russians and us get into a, fr a fricus. And the same thing in the Pacific. So there's no place that is out of the range of the guns. And everything can be seen, from satellites all the way down to ground sensors. So those are the challenges that we have. Too many of us would get killed in bad command posts because we didn't think it through. This is combat in Ukraine. And of course, for the information war, all of this is recorded with GoPros and other things. So now you've got ammunition for the information war if you wish to use it so. And as you know, if you're following the fighting, Andrivka is one of the major battles right now and going on. But it's been going on for a couple of months. But look at the battlescape that you have here, this battle space. How do you hide in this? How do you mask your forces? How do you mass your forces for an attack in a transparent battle space where if you do mass, where you get more than three or four vehicles together, you become a target. And the target that sticks out gets hammered. So this is pretty interesting. Watch this. The main purpose of me showing you this is this right here. So the drone now has a speaker on it, and it's telling the soldiers to surrender. And the Russians are coming out of their bunkers to surrender. We're offering you a chance to surrender for one simple reason. We need prisoners to exchange. You have 10 minutes to decide. Next time you're at the NTC or someplace, imagine if a drone comes over and gives you that ultimatum. Think about it. Three Russians emerge to surrender. There they are. They're going to surrender to drones. And then the Russians launch mortars on the guys who are surrendering, because they have drones watching which keeps everybody else from surrendering. Now these two get away. Just imagine. That's the kind of war they're fighting there now. That's the kind of war we could be in as well. And then there's what's going on right now in Gaza.
So you get the idea. The Israelis, of course, are responding. Esh in Hebrew means fire. Those guys are wearing ghillie suits. They were camouflaged, but of course they're running on a road. Thermal sites. How do you hide from thermal sites? All of that you need to know. Now these are the nine disruptors. Take a picture of this with your cameras or write it down. These nine disruptors are something that you need to understand. These change everything in warfare. Every time you make a plan, every time you consider a military operation, you should consider these nine disruptors. Now you might come up with a few more, but nine is about enough. Now let's talk about each one of these a little bit. The first is the transparent battle space. Who here can tell me what the transparent battle space is? I know there's somebody right over here who wants to answer that question. Go ahead, thank you. You. Right from the ground to satellites. So if you're the enemy and you want to knock out his eyes and ears, what do you do? So we're going to have to take out the eyes from satellites down to ground level. So who's planning to do that right now? Yeah, China. Interesting. Russia has a capability too, but it looks like the Chinese have a greater capability. Now, anybody here in the Space Force? Nobody? Okay. Well, if we had somebody from the Space Force, they could tell you all about it. I hope. Okay, so the transparent battle space, everything can be seen. And it can be seen in five different ways. It can be seen in the optical spectrum. That's why the U.S. Army is the best at camouflage in the world, because we want to take away the optical spectrum from the enemy, right? Yes. We've got to work at this. Two things are needed for good camouflage. Leadership and discipline. Now, it's also good to have equipment. But if you don't have those two things, you're not going to have any, any camouflage. We have to take away the optical spectrum. We have to camouflage. And we not only have to camouflage in the old way, you know, left and right, but how about up? The enemy is attacking now from the top down, so we need to camouflage our top. We need to make sure what, we need to know what we look like from the sky. We can do that with small UASs flying over our formations all the time and videoing us and using that for after action reviews. We need to do that, right? What is it going to take to do that? Everybody tells me they can't buy the drones. They don't have this, they don't have that. Figure it out, get it done. Get the drones, go on the blue list, buy the ones that are on the GSA catalog, take video of your formations and training. We've got to do it. The next is uh, the first strike advantage. The first strike advantage. More than likely, we're not going to attack in a surprise attack China or Russia or Iran or North Korea. Because if we wanted to do that, we could have done it many other times in the past when we were much stronger in different areas. But the probability of a Chinese, North Korean, Russian, or Iranian first strike against us is pretty high. And we need to plan for it. And we're not training for it. When we go to the NTC or the JRTC, we use the Desert Storm model. We get off the trains or we get off whatever transportation we have. We pile up a bunch of equipment and a bunch of people. We have this admin time period. And we say, the war will start on Tuesday at 8 in the morning. That's great. But what we should be practicing is moving to those places distributed, dispersed, coming in, getting off the train, immediately going into masking positions, trying to give instructions distributed and, and, and displaced so that we're not hard targets, so, that we're, so we are hard targets to kill and we're not easy targets to destroy. Our logistics setup is another problem. Our whole first strike advantage is an issue that we have to solve. It keeps me up at night. I will tell you, I worry about this a lot. We have got to think this through. How many of our positions in Romania, in Poland, in Germany, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or anywhere else in Europe have hardened bunkers? We're in peacetime barracks. We're an easy target to kill. 
Now, some people will say, that's a tripwire. Okay. But if we lose that many forces that could be lost in the first strikes against those kind, of, those kind of places, how are we going to reconstitute those folks? How are we going to reconstitute those units? Same thing in the Pacific. You know, we have reinforced Guam with good air defense. By the way, we're taking away the Iron Dome from Guam and giving it to Israel. That's, that's open source, okay? But we have other systems in Guam. But we don't have any bunkers. We don't have anything that's harder to hit. Now, bunkers are not the solution to everything, but at least if you don't have a place to go to and you're just in a building like this, you're not going to be safe. We have got to think this through. We've got to disperse our forces. We've got to make ourselves so hard that the enemy says we don't have enough force to hit them. They'll survive that first strike. So we can't do a first strike. Wouldn't that be great? If you're the enemy now, put yourself in the Chinese or the Russian position and you see our positions the way they are, what are you thinking? Exactly so. Anyone? Okay. Well, in Russian, they have a thing called, they say exactly so, tak tochna. When they salute, they don't say, good morning, sir, or, good morning, ma'am. They say tak tochna, exactly so, meaning I obey. So we have to figure out how to do this. We have to figure out how to be hard nut to crack because the first strike is what the enemy will wage against us. Next, the AI in the temple of war. Artificial intelligence, there are three types. So that you understand artificial intelligence. And you must understand what artificial intelligence is. You don't have to write code, but you need to understand what it is. There's artificial narrow intelligence, ANI. That's what we use right now. Your computers, everything is ANI. In fact, everything in the world is ANI. We don't have anything more than artificial narrow intelligence. It's narrow. It's limited. It does some things very well. It sorts data well. It is able to take a whole bunch of pictures and figure out the right face, figure out the right target. It can do that in machine speeds. It's amazing in narrow tasks. Next is artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence is when you get a terminator. You can basically have a machine that can think a little bit on its own. We don't have that. Now, we are pushing the borders on that, but we don't have that yet. AGI has not been announced. When it does, be worried, because if four or five AGIs get together, then they create the next element, if they're allowed to, and that's artificial superintelligence. And that's when the artificial intelligence is learning so fast, it's learning centuries faster per day than we are, and who knows what will happen with artificial superintelligence. And this, of course, is the stuff of science fiction novels. What you have to worry about is artificial neural intelligence and maximizing it, because we can use ANI, we'll just call it AI, we can use AI to speed up human decision making, to do better target recognition, to be able to make loitering munitions hit the exact target that we want them to hit. We can use it for a lot of things, and that's what we're using it for now. But it's speeding up everything. When you can go in and destroy a battery of six to eight guns in 30 seconds that used to take how long to destroy with dumb artillery and trying to find it with scouting and everything else, everything happens faster. So everything is super fast. The tempo of war is increasing. How will you handle that? The next is top attack. As I mentioned, top attack is the way that the enemy will hit us. This is the preferred method of war. At first, during the, the days of the Cold War, for instance, or World War II, the flanks and the front of your tank were very important, so we made really strong tanks with good frontal armor and good flank armor and stuff like that. Then we started putting on all sorts of trophy systems and stuff to defeat enemy systems that are coming in. Then the enemy started to blow us up from the bottom during the, the wars against, uh, you know, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so here we were now making vehicles that were harder to blow up from the bottom. And now they hit us from the top. Well, you can't be hard everywhere. You can only be so, you can only have so much armor. But what you see time and time again now are these cope cages on the top of tanks. Anybody know what a cope cage is? Bar armor on the top of a tank. Now, the Russians had this when they went into Ukraine, and everybody's going, ha, what are they doing that for? Makes a lot of sense to put that bar armor up to stop an RPG, which is slow, and a Molotov cocktail. You might catch the Molotov cocktail and not hit the tank and therefore burst and all that good stuff. And they thought they were going into somewhat of a city fight. If you look carefully at what's going on in Gaza right now, you'll see cope cages, bar armor, on the top of Merkabas. Think about it. Now, the next is fully autonomous. More and more weapons are becoming fully autonomous. Why? 
you can't jam them when they're fully autonomous. You see, if they're not fully autonomous, that means somebody's directing them, first person view drone, and while he is playing or she is playing with the controls, you could take out your little rifle that has a, a jammer on it, your, your, your jamming rifle that we're trying to buy, which I, I think is interesting. And we're going to try to jam that thing right before it hits you because your range is only about, well, it's not very far. So you're going to knock those things out of the sky because you're going to break their signal with a more powerful signal. Makes sense, right? But if, you're a, if, you're, if you have fully autonomous systems, they don't need a signal. So you're not going to knock them out with jamming rifles, and more and more systems will become fully autonomous and won't need GPS. And these things become smaller and smaller to put into, the, into, the, into a drone, and they're going to they're be a problem. The Shahid 136, how many people know what that is? Raise your hand. Okay, all of you should raise your hand. Okay, this is an Iranian drone that is used by the Russians, and they're bombing Kiev and other cities with it. It is, a, it is a buzz bomb, like World War I V1 almost, in, in many ways. It's, it's, uh, it's, its accuracy depends on what they put in it, but normally they're not putting in much accuracy to it because they want it cheap. And they're sending these off as like cruise missiles to knock, to knock, knock out stuff in cities. It can hit a power plant. It can hit a, uh, um, a, a, a series of electrical stations. It can take out your, your heating and your, your cooling uh, systems, and that's what they want to do. And so they're going to use these. So how are we going to shoot these things down? You can't jam them. They're not jammable. They just keep going. Because they have set, set, like a V1 had, they have a set condition to go, and they have a distance to go, and they'll go there. So how do you knock those down? You have to knock them down. There's a lot of talk about taking small drones out with nets and stuff, and that's great for little airports, but it's not what we need. We need to shoot these things down and destroy them. And you can't do it with small arms fire. Picture after picture video after video of U Armenians, of Ukrainians, trying to shoot down with small arms, small UAS, and missing every time. Now, maybe if we had a bunch of really good shotguns with a triple lot buck or something, we might have a better chance, but we don't have that. So what are you going to do now? How are you going to knock these things down? How do you fight against them now in the counter UAS fight? Fully autonomous is going to make that harder. Super swarm. Definitions are important. Socrates, who I know you all study, said that all definition, correction, all understanding, all understanding starts with definition. Now, if all understanding starts with definition, then our definitions are important. The super swarm is a, is a new word that you need to put in your brain housing group. A swarm is a tactic. Custer was swarmed at the Little Bighorn. Okay, you don't want to be Custer. Swarming is bad when they're swarming you. That means they're hitting you from multiple sides and usually faster than you can respond. Now, a, super, a swarm of drones is basically right now a bunch of drones we send out and they attack according to their targeting parameters. So we might have drones that say, okay, attack artillery, attack air defense, and pictures of those systems could be embedded into the algorithms of the drones so that in fact they would look for those and they would see them and they would be able to hit them. And sometimes we could even make algorithms to say, talk to each other so you don't hit the same target. But that's not really a swarm. That's kind of a, just a gaggle of drones. And that's what we've been doing so far in warfare. That's what the Azerbaijanis did. That's what the Ukrainians are doing. And that's what the Israelis will do, although they're going to push it a bit. And they're going to move more toward the super swarm. The super swarm is when you have a bunch of drones that all work together with an external AI, an AI that puts them all together that one person can control. So instead of one guy taking care of one drone in his, in his first person view goggles like you saw in that first slide that I showed you, that person can now control a swarm of drones, a super swarm that could go from point A to point B to point C, attriting itself as it went along, getting smaller and smaller but killing everything according to its parameters underneath it's, it's killing area. And that's how you create a breakthrough in a situation like Ukraine. Now, we can do this if we want to. We should want to. And uh, we should figure out how to do it because it would give us a tremendous advantage. Now, when you see a light show of drones, and it's, ooh, ah, isn't that wonderful? Look at that panda. Oh, the star. Why is it a star? You know, it's a red star. Okay, all these things, you know. 
All of these little things that you see for these shows, just imagine all those as loitering munitions. Okay, so we can do this, we just have to think it through. And it's about our thinking first. The next thing is the kill web. So definition matters, as I said. You know what a kill chain is. Who can tell me what a kill chain is? Anyone. Don't worry, we won't laugh at you. Okay, sensor to shooter. Okay, it is a, let's expand that a bit. Okay, a kill chain is a human-centric sensor to shooter arrangement of, of gates, basically, that say, yes, 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 shoot, right? So you have certain things that have to happen in this kill chain, otherwise it's not a chain. It'd be a kill dot. Okay, so it's a kill chain. So you've got a bunch of things here. Now, you should know what the kill chains are for your weapon systems. I bet you don't. What's a kill chain for a 777 howitzer? What are the steps from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to get on target? You could write those out. It'd be really easy to do that if you thought it through, get the right people who know how to do it. And now you look at that and you go, wow, if I was the enemy, how would I disrupt? How would I deceive that kill chain? And how would I disrupt that kill chain? Because I can see the parts of it. Wow, think about that. So how many of you tonight will start studying the Chinese kill chain for a rocket system and then lay out that kill chain steps so that you can come in the next morning and say, hey, I got the kill chain for this Chinese rocket and this is how we can deceive and disrupt it the best. Yeah. How many intelligence officers do we have here in the room? Guys, not intelligent officers. I mean guys in the intelligence branch. Go ahead. Okay. Do you know what the kill chains are for most enemy weapon systems? Has anybody ever asked that question? Wow. Why? Change that. You become the agent of change. Make it happen. Think about it. We've got to start breaking this down to its little parts and figuring out how to defeat these guys. The kill web is not a kill chain. And you see people sometimes, you'll hear people say, well, this is our kill web. No, it's not your kill web. It's your kill chain. Language matters. Definitions matter. A kill web means something different. A kill web, in general understanding amongst a few people in DARPA and other places, has meant this, an AI-enabled kill chain. So now your kill chain is enabled by artificial intelligence. So this is what you get in a very crude and rude way. Okay, not so much rude, but crude. Analogy. Imagine an Excel spreadsheet, and one side has all the targets that have been identified by every ISR source known to your force. Land, air, sea, all domain, ISR shown here. These are the targets that are, we know are there, and we know they're there right now. And then immediately line up all of the systems that can kill them that are in range and match them immediately with artificial intelligence. And then execute. And you could execute in different ways. You could do it by simultaneity. You could do it simultaneously. You could do it sequentially. You could do it you know, one today, two tomorrow, whatever you want to do. That's a kill web. We don't have a kill web. The Russians don't have a kill web. The Chinese are working on a kill web. There's some evidence that they're practicing it, open source. But the Israelis, they demonstrated a near kill web. You notice I said near. It was darn close in the 2021 Israel Hamas war. That's why it's worthy of study the first war in history won by artificial intelligence. The guys who create the kill web first will have a tremendous advantage. And we have to figure out how to defend against it. Visualize in all domains. This is a huge problem. How do you see in cyber? How do you see in space? If you're going to do cross-domain maneuver, the commander has to be able to visualize all the domains, plus the information war and the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we say, well, let's get some system to do this, and let's turn it over to Raytheon to figure out, or let's figure out with, you know, somebody. No, we have to think through what it is, and it's very simple for us right now. For instance, what we could do is we could say, all right, we need a common operational picture, right? Who's not, who doesn't want a common operational picture? Raise your hand. Right, everybody wants one. 
Who's ever seen one? Right. Now, the first step, if definition is important, is understanding the elements. What are the elements of a common operational picture? Could be, figure it out. My point is, is list them, go through a rigorous understanding of what a common operational picture should be, and then figure out how to make it for your unit. Now, how do we see in space? How do we see in cyber? How do we see information on the, on the uh, information war? How do we know if the electromagnetic spectrum is working for us or against us? Those kind of things. We could put all that down as the elements, and then we can figure out what to do, and then we can tell industry what to do, because industry doesn't have a clue. They'll come up with a bunch of stuff, and we'll go, how do, we don't know how to use that. We should come up with the thought process. That's our job. We should be thinking about this. And then they can come and figure out the ideas. Some of those guys can do tremendous things, but they won't get it if we can't show them the way. We have to be pathfinders here. And then the last is decision dominance. You'll hear a lot of people talk about it. They don't know what it really is. I will tell you that I think it is, decision dominance, is being able to control all the rest of these disruptors in such a way that you dominate the OODA loop or ob observe, orient, decide, and act, that you're doing it so fast that the enemy looks like they're standing still and you're beating the heck out of them with 15, 20 punches. You know, you are Bruce Lee and they are not. And you can do that if you have decision dominance. And those of you who don't know Bruce Lee is, look it up. It's <laughs> I show my age there. All right. Now, this is very important. This is a term that you need to put in your brain housing group and remember. You need to use this. You need to take a picture of this right now with your phones or write it down. But sear it into your mind because we need to learn how to do masking. Now, I asked earlier in Russian who spoke Russian and nobody answered. So somebody here might know, though, what maskorovka means. This is not maskorovka. Okay, that's a different subject, and I can show you the Russian understanding of Maskarovka, and there's some elements in here, of course, but it's not the same. This is for us. This is our definition, or this is my definition, actually, of masking, and you guys should take this and change it any way you want to make it better, because I don't have all the good ideas, but I'll tell you, we need this badly. We need to learn how to mask, and it's two things. Okay, it's a full spectrum, multi-domain effort to deceive enemy sensors, and disrupt enemy targeting. We don't have to be invisible, but we have to deceive their sensors. If their sensors see us off, like we're not really at that spot, we're kind of over there, we win. We have to deceive their sensors. So what can you do low tech in any unit to deceive enemy sensors? Huh? Decoys, good. How many of you have decoys assigned to your units? None, of course not. We don't have any decoys assigned to our units. How many of you remember the rubber tank from World War II? Everybody loves that picture, right? That's great. That's a decoy. No, that is a great decoy, and that was really good at the strategic level. Because at that time, we expected Operation Overlord was happening, and we put all these rubber tanks out in the field, and we expected German aircraft, and we let them get in. Haha. <laughs> take pictures of this, and they went, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff over here. Patton must be getting ready to come to the Pas-de-Calais, and we fooled him. Great, it worked once, good. We're not going to have rubber tanks in our units too often, although it's a good thing if you can get them. So how could you make a decoy in your unit for a command post? Outstanding. That is a very, very good answer. And there's many more things that we could do, and we could probably come up with a dozen. If you just sat down and said, how many decoys could we use in our unit, no matter what unit you got? Air Force, infantry. Anybody in the Navy here? OK, we never get the Navy. Just think about it. There's all sorts of things we can do with decoys. Now, for instance, the other day, I was talking to a Special Forces unit, and I said, just take some E-type silhouettes and put them up on your flank when you have a defensive position. And they said, sir, what's an E-type silhouette? Mm -hmm. So those used to be the silhouettes. That was the name we called them when you were shooting targets at the rifle and pistol range. 
There's all sorts of decoys that we can make that we have already. We can just put them in the back of a vehicle or we could even carry them around. For instance, you can make a smudge pot. You know what a smudge pot is? Nobody knows what a smudge pot is anymore. Okay. A smudge pot is a, is a, is a little, take a, take a coffee can. Okay, we don't get coffee in cans anymore. Okay, take a can. Take a can and put some sand and rocks in it. Put some fuel in it and light it. Just step back a bit so you don't blow yourself up, okay, because it won't blow up. And it'll burn real slow for a long time. Put it out, and it looks like a target to a drone. Now, you don't want to be around it. You want to put it somewhere off. It's a decoy, okay? For instance, you got a command post, and you want to put up a decoy? Put up a tent. They think we're stupid enough to put our CPs in tents. Can you imagine? So just put up a tent and put some sticks in the ground, and it'll look like a CP, and they'll blow it up while you're in your nice, hard, armored vehicle hiding from the enemy and moving all the time because you got Mission Command on the move, right? That's what you got. Yep. Okay. So that's masking, and you need to know masking because we need to deceive them, and then we need to disrupt them. And the disrupting part is part of what I was getting at with knowing their kill chain. How do we disrupt their targeting? What if every time they targeted, they were off? What if they were shooting at stuff that wasn't there? What if in cyber we could give them so many targets that they were firing at a needle in a stack of needles they didn't know what they were shooting at? That's what we got to do. Do we do this routinely in practice? No. Why not? Make it happen. You're the leaders of our army, and you say, oh, it's not my job. It is your job. You can do it, and you can make a difference. You can actually make this happen. You can make it happen more than anyone. And it doesn't take any additional money, any additional anything. It just takes thinking and training and discussing and dialoguing and maybe even writing a few articles or something, but getting people to think. We've got to deceive their sensors and disrupt their targeting. And that should be one of our main things. It should be a question you ask in every mission. How will we deceive their sensors in this operation? Well, sir, we didn't think about that. Well, good, let's think about it. How do we deceive their sensors? And then how do we disrupt their targeting? That question should be asked in every plan. The range of this is zero. It's like an excuse. Now, these are the areas I talked about earlier that you need to know how to hide in. The optical, the thermal, the electronic, the acoustic, and the quantum. Oh, yes. Wait till I get to that one. The optical we talked about. We got to be good at camouflage. We're not. There's no excuse. We've got to get good at camouflage, period. Now, you've got to have the right camouflage. Don't have you know, tree limbs on when you're in the city. You know, be in the right camouflage. We have to be able to camouflage. Now, thermal. How do we hide in the thermal arena? We look like a sore thumb. We look like a hot sore thumb to a thermal site. Our tocks, for instance, are amazing. They're just hot as heck. We got the engines running almost all the time. And when they're not running, we got the generators running full speed, out in the open, not dug in, not camouflaged, and there they are. And by the way, if you're going to dig them in, you got to give them enough room so they don't overheat. So think about that. By the way, these, these thermal images, everyone has them now. We used to own the night. We were the only ones with thermal. It was grand. But those days are over. You can now buy a thermal site for your hunting rifle in Texas for about 200 bucks. No kidding. You need that for the deer hunting at night. So what I'm saying is this. We can get thermal sites cheap, really cheap, and everybody's got them. Iranian tanks have thermal sites in them. I know you know that. Not all of them, but most of them. North Korean, probably not so much. You know, Russians, eh, depending on right now, they're down to T-62s and T-55s, so probably not. But the bottom line is, is there are thermal sites all over the battle space, and they're putting them in drones, and that's the biggest deal. They'll see you in the drones, and of course, they'll see you thermally with all sorts of aircraft, hail, mail, uh, drones, and also satellites. So we have to figure out how to do thermal dampening, how to, how to look less hot or cold depending on the environment. And all you have to do is blend into your background. Just don't be any hotter or colder than your background. So there's a way to do that if you practice, if you try. But you've got to think about it, because if you don't think about it and you say it's impossible, they didn't make a system that does this, because we don't make a single system with thermal dampening in mind, with thermal camouflage in mind. 
You know, we got to start doing that. We got to start demanding it. The next is electronic. We are an army that swims in a sea of electrons, in the Air Force particularly. I mean, you know this. You take away the electrons, and we're down to fighting with rocks. We have a real big problem. We have also a thing called nomophobia. Who knows what nomophobia is? Huh? No, nice try. Almost as important, though, the fear of not having your, your smartphone or cell phone with you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Makivka. Makivka. Remember Makivka. This last New Year's Eve, the Russians put 350, 500 mobilniks, they don't even know the number, into a building, into a school. Everybody was on their, their, their cell phone talking to mama back in Russia. Ukrainians saw it, killed them, killed most of them. A couple of strikes hit those buildings, most of them were dead. But we don't do that. We never take our smartphones to the battle space. We don't take our cell phones to the battlefield, do we? We make sure that every soldier doesn't have those when we go tra to training. Uh huh. So what are we going to do now? You know, we got to figure this out. They're going to find you. A cell phone says, I am here, where are you? Every second. I am here, where are you? Everybody can see this. This is the simplest way to find someone. So we have to figure this out. But it's not just cell phones. All of our other electronics give away an amazing picture. This is the electronic picture of an Army Brigade combat team at the National Training Center. Many of you have seen this before. Red is the highest level of, of electronic transmission, and then it goes down to you know, yellow and green. So if you're the enemy commander, and you have long-range precision fires, and you got this picture, what are you shooting at? Right, and then what's going to happen? It's going to go clear. It won't be red anymore, but that'll be a bad thing, because that means we're dead. So we've got to figure out ways to mitigate this electronic signature. And one of the ways to do it is to go dark. Could you go dark for two hours? Can't get an F-35 to go dark. It would collapse. It would fall from the sky. You know? It's got other things that will help it, though. You know, we've designed it for that. But a Brigade CP is not an F-35. But could it go dark for two hours, according to plan, and use a World War I method? You know, from 8 to 9 or 8 to 10, we're not going to have any electronics on. And we know we're not going to have electronics on because we have this system that will tell us that they're off, and then we're turning it off. And just imagine what would happen if suddenly your forces went dark and the enemy's watching you. Where'd they go? Okay, get some more sensors out there to find them. Ah, now we get them acting. Now we can start shooting down some of those optical sensors and maybe some other sensors. But guess what? Acoustic. Drones now have acoustic sensors. They can hear the crack of the guns. They will know where the artillery is shooting. They will know where the generators are generating. And their ears are better than ours. And it's the most passive, cheapest way to make a sensor, to make a drone find, an, uh, find a location. So we have to also look at acoustic methods to try to lower the acoustic signature. That means we can't have generators just out pumping away without any kind of a muffler or kind of system on it. We've got to figure out how to make things quieter. All of you that have ever been in the field and they told you that the uh, talk was at 123456 and you were out looking for it and it was really at 135725 and you're trying to find it, you would take off your helmet and you would listen for the sound of the generators. Well, the drones will do the same thing. And then lastly, quantum. Quantum you don't need to be too concerned about right now. But quantum sensing is going to become a big thing soon, soon like in a decade. Because quantum sensors at some point will be able to be shot out across the battlefield like snowflakes, will all interconnect and talk to each other, and when you move by, they'll say, a tank is moving by, and they'll know where you are. Right now, the Chinese have quantum sensors that they're using to find quantum radars to look at, look at our stealth aircraft. And they've been relatively successful with these, but 
Uh, it's exquisite technology right now, so it's not something that we need to spend a lot of time with, but you need to understand it. You need to understand it's on the horizon. Innovation. This is kind of interesting. Again, don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. A high-tech weapon made with low-tech components. Wax cardboard and rubber bands, but with military-grade guidance systems. And what I'm excited about is I think it provides the, the, the warfighter the opportunity to innovate in the battle space. The cardboard drone launched by hand or catapult. 100 a month are being sent to Ukrainian soldiers arriving as flat packs. And then you assemble it uh, as, an, as, as if it's from Ikea and then you can use it. It's cheap, it's very important because you can use it and it's expendable. Used for supply and medicine drops as a decoy and for lethal missions. I know it's been used for that purposes and, uh, and so this is how drones are used in this war. So they can use it for bombing purposes or put a camera there and use it for reconnaissance purposes just to spy out what's ahead of them. But the ma so imagine why don't we have these for training? They're disposable. They're relatively cheap. They're made in Australia. We kind of like the Australians. We haven't declared war on them lately, so you know they're our allies. So I would think it'd be really neat if we could get some of these, because if, they, if we can't figure out how to make a cardboard drone, at least we could buy theirs. But the bottom line is, is innovation matters. Now, Americans are greatly innovative. But we have a, we have a weapons development process and when I was in the Army Science Board for three years, I had a gentleman explain to me the prog how the whole Army acquisition process went and how it had to go from these different steps. And nothing could break this, and this was religion. And this is one of our problems. Now, it brings goodness, but we've got to go faster. In World War II, we were producing an aircraft every hour, a ship every 24 hours. What does it take to make a ship today? What does it take to make an aircraft today? And what's the OR rate of our aircraft? We really got to think some of these things through. This might be a great way to get some training devices, uh, this, uh, the SIPAC uh, cardboard drone. OK, so here are seven observations from all these recent wars. We're tying it up here. First of all, you got to think to win. All of you need to think. You need to think deeply about our profession. You need to study these wars. You need to understand the nine disruptors. You need to train as you fight. If we don't train as we fight, every time we train, that sets the bar. That's excellence. May not be. And remember this, you do not rise to the level of your expectations. You fall to the level of your training. If your training level is zero, you are a zero. Your training level is one, you're probably still a zero. Your training level is two, you get the idea. What does it take to be proficient? For instance, CP battle drills. You have a brigade command post. How many battle drills do we need for a command post in the brigade? I don't know, but let's say we have seven. I like seven. So let's say we pick seven. We have seven battle drills. How often do we practice them? Well, only when we go to the NTC. You're a zero. You get it. You have to iterate, iterate, and iterate. The target that sticks out gets hammered. Period. If you have more than four vehicles on the battle space together, it looks like something bigger than a platoon, and it's a target that sticks out. You got 10 vehicles together, oh, oh I'm going to hit that target. 20 vehicles, oh my god, 50 vehicles, we're going to get Scunion to come down on you. No more than four vehicles together for a core CP. Oh, you can't do that. No, but you can reconstitute a CP after it's destroyed? No, you can't. We can't do that very easily. So imagine a mesh CP arrangement where four vehicles, no more than four vehicles, were together in good communications, and then distance four more vehicles, and then distance four more vehicles. And you set it up in such a way that most of them are armored, and that all of them could operate on the move. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's what we need to move toward. We cannot operate out of tents. We need to dig in to survive and attack to win. We need to learn how to dig in. Now, I got it. You know, Patton said, never dig in. Yeah, I got it. Okay, we want to be offensive-minded, but 
We need to be able to dig in, particularly logistics. We need to be able to dig in CPs. We actually need to learn how to make trenches again. No, that's so old school, World War I. We're better than that, really, really. When the artillery starts to fall, you want to be in a trench. Modern war is a shot to the head, not a shot to the body. They will find the command post. It's on their to-do list. Number one thing to hit, kill the command post. So if you're in a command post, and how many of you served in command posts at some time in your time in the Army? Yes, all of you. Were those, were those uh, command posts protected by air defense? Were they protected? Did you have dug-in foxholes and, and positions to run to if the artillery came? Were you in tents? Think about all those things and now change your thinking. And as angry as that makes you, get over it and change your thinking. Fighters and logisticians must think and train alike. Our logisticians are not ready for war. We've set them up for failure. We've got to fix this. We cannot put masses of equipment together. How many pictures have you seen in Ukraine of Russian ammo depots going up? You know, we can't do this. So we've got to figure out a new way. We need a mesh logistics network. Whole nother briefing, which I could talk to you about. And if anybody's interested in that, contact me. And then last, we need to fight combined arms differently. We're fighting combined arms in the old way. We're teaching the Ukrainians how to fight in the old way, and they're dying in the old way. We've got to change our thinking. Bots before boots. Bots before boots. Send the robots first to figure things out and see what's going on. We need more robotic systems to be able to do that. We need to change 21st century combined arms. We can't mass in the old way. We have to be distributed and bring our fires together and then mass for very short periods of time when we have an ascendancy in counter UAS and the artillery strikes and all that. We've got to think all those things through because if we try to do it in the old way, you'll, you'll, what happens is what you're seeing now in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian counteroffense is having a lot of problems. And then, then the next thing, Questions. Now, you can reach me at johnantel.com or for you, I give you my personal email address. The Army Values, L D R S H I P 77 at gmail.com. L D R S H I P 77 at gmail.com. Contact me if I can help you or your team. I've given over 283 presentations to the U.S. Army and Allied Armies at no cost. I do that because I care about us winning. Most of those are MS teams because traveling, you know, gets old after a while. So if you want a presentation and we can set up an MS teams link, I'm happy to do it. If you want me to come in person, we just have to work out the schedule. So that's my presentation. And now what are your questions? Sir, Major Dearman Sams, with respect to Azerbaijan, um, to what extent do you think that the investments in modernization and arms over the last 30 years um, have made war with Armenia more likely? And are there indicators that we can observe for future conflict? Thank you. Okay, where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't hear you very well. Say that again. Yes, sir. <laughs> With respect to Azerbaijan, to what extent do we think the investments and modernization efforts they made over the last 30 years have made war with Armenia more likely? And are there indicators that you found that, would, uh, that we could observe with respect to future conflict? Boy, that was just, from where I am, it's just mumbling. Go ahead. Yes, Ask sir. me now. Yes, sir. Forget that. Yeah. Excellent question. Has that made, has that made war more likely? And what, what indicators are war more likely in, in, in Azerbaijan and Armenia? Oh, well, we'll, we'll talk. Okay. Um, several, two questions. One, um, good question. Uh, Azerbaijan made an investment in high tech systems. They bought the best Israeli kit to win the war. They practiced with it in several small skirmishes before the war. So this wasn't something they just brought out 
you know, and did it instantly. They prepared for this. So the Azerbaijani, one of the reasons we need to study that war is to see how the Azerbaijanis ramped up their thinking, their training, their acquisition and everything to have a niche advantage over their enemy and drive it home to the hilt. So they did that. Now, what about future wars? Armenia is finished. Azerbaijan will take whatever it wants and Armenia will agree. Armenia threw itself in the hands of the Russians and said, protect us, my Slavic brothers. And the Russians said, yeah, you're really a pest. No, we don't care. So they put some, they put some forces in there to, to uh, stop the uh, Azerbaijanis from just overrunning everything. But the key will be Stepanakert. If you know anything about the situation in Azerbaijan and Armenia, if, if Stepanakert is ever taken over by the, uh, by the uh, Azerbaijanis, it's completely over. But Nagorno-Karabakh is now Azerbaijan. And, and they're never going to give it back until the Armenians can win it back. And, and that doesn't look good at any time soon. Good question. Next question. Sir. Sure. I mean, think of all the training aids that we need. We need drone training aids. Now, we say, we don't have drones. We can't use drones. They won't let us buy drones. Okay, we can get drones in VBS-3, and we could actually train people in VBS-3 to start using drones. VBS-3 is a simulation all of you should know about. We could start doing all sorts of things even if we don't have the systems yet. In World War II, we did this. You know, you saw the pictures of wooden rifles and, and, and you know, carts with tank on them and stuff. That was silly. We laugh at those. But they were training the mind. You train the mind first, then you get the rest. The training aids we need are amazing. I just heard that you threw out all the Duncamp stuff uh, from, uh, that we used to use and all the micro armor that we used to use back in the Cold War, that it was all thrown away here. Millions of dollars worth of it. Is that true? OK, well, yeah, yeah I knew you would not agree. Yeah, OK, or not, not, uh, not uh, confess. But anyway, the bottom line is, is that we need to have everything from, from tactical decision games to to, to board games, to sand table exercises, to thought experiments, to actually using constructive virtual and live simulation. Now, all the things I mentioned earlier were constructive simulation. You can train staffs and you can train CP battle drills. Some people say, well, I don't have time to train CP battle drills with my, with my, battle, uh, with my uh, uh, people who run the, the command post. They're just too busy. They all have jobs. I go, OK. <laughs> all right, so you can't train them for war. All right, well, how about this? What if we had some constructive exercises once a week where we went through the battle drills so that we could train their minds? So then it was easier when they first saw it for real. There's all sorts of things you can do. Don't take no for an answer. Don't t let anyone tell you what they can't do. Get them to tell you what they can do. Anyway, we have a lot of things we can do with simulations and with uh, training aids. So thank you. Next question. Sir. The way that nations what? Right. There's a lot of political theories about, you know, how war develop societies and, and how nations that are technological are going to find a technological approach to war versus nations that may not be as technological. All that's true. What I focus on is how we fight and what these wars are all about and how we can change our, our thinking about fighting. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there with people much better than me uh, who are versed in the politics of all this and will tell you, you know, what the theories of war and anti-war are. But what I'm telling you is it doesn't matter to you. You're going to war. If you don't think so, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. If you think so, you're getting ready for the fight. If you're not getting ready for the fight, and you're our fighters, who is? What could happen tomorrow that could cause us to go to war? Iran could sink one of our ships. Russia could make a mistake. China could decide to launch. It only takes one guy to make the decision. I can tell you a million reasons why the Russians and the Chinese should never have another war. I could tell you a bunch of reasons why Putin should have never invaded Ukraine. But he did. I could tell you why Xi shouldn't try to take Taiwan. But he probably will. 
Who knows? These guys are not 10 feet tall. They got big problems, no doubt about it. But we have to get ready for war. And we have to think as if it's going to happen tomorrow in order to do that. Because we can't wait for 2030 or 2035. Too many times we've done that in the past. We'll solve that problem 10 years from now when I'm no longer in charge. Yeah, I got it. We got to solve the problems now and get ready for war today. What do we need? Again, if this was October 1941, we would be sitting here saying, the Japanese will never attack us. We're America. Japan, you got to be kidding me. They can't even see straight. Think about all the things we said back then. Our perception was so weird. We had no idea how the Japanese would ever launch an attack on Pearl Harbor. That was out of the blue. Now, we have not been surprised since Pearl Harbor, right? So what's wrong? How can we keep getting surprised? Because we don't have the foresight to look ahead, and we're not taking a lot of this seriously. We need to take these guys seriously when they say they're going to kill us. It's our job to beat them and win. It's our job to be so hard and so mean that when they see us, they say, we don't want to fight with those guys. But our record right now right now, kind of says to them, hmm, maybe we can push them around. I mean, look what they did in Afghanistan. Look how they left Afghanistan. Think about that. They do. Look at what's happening now. We've been shooting at their guys in Iraq, and they haven't done anything. We flew some drones over their fleet. We shot, they shot them down, but we told them we weren't really trying to hit them. Of course, if they'd hit us, what would they have said? Yeah, they wouldn't have said, oops. They would have said, ha-ha, we got you. Who knows? Who knows what they say? But the point is, is that anything can happen. We have to get ready now. So the urgency should be in your brain housing group and your heart right now to get ready. That's what we get paid to do. Okay, good question. Now, any other questions? Sir? Oh, that's a super question and a whole nother briefing. You see, one of the problems I have is I only got, like, they're trying to yank me off the stage now. I've only got so much time. Okay, so the whole transitioning to the front, to the battle space, huge problem for the Army and for the Navy, too, by the way. The Navy's got huge problems. Now, just to give you an example, in the, year before World War, before, in the years between World War I and World War II, the Navy had a plan. If Plan Orange. So if the, if the Japanese were going to attack, they were going to take the fleet, our Navy was going to take the fleet and move out to the fleet and fight this amazing battleship destroyer, and maybe some aircraft carrier, battles in the Pacific, deep in the Pacific. So they took this and they gave it to the Army War College, and the Army War College went through years of war gaming, red teaming the whole process. And they said, hey, great plan, but guess what? You get out there in the middle of the Pacific, you're out of fuel. And nobody can move. And there you are. You're going to be out of fuel. We did the calculations, and they go, what do you mean? Oh, my God, we're out of fuel. So we need to have a whole bunch of things to set this up. We need these islands. We need these fuel depots. We need all this stuff. That's how you start planning ahead. Now, our challenge today is that we've got to start planning ahead for all of these other wars. And getting there is a huge problem. Getting there is a huge problem. Now, there's some interesting ideas. You know, one of the things I wanted to do was let's make an armored vehicle that fits into a conics so that every time you see a ship with conics, you don't know if it's the U.S. Army or not. Wow, wouldn't that be neat? And you can offload them at every port. Holy moly. But that's, you know, another briefing. So the point is, is that we really need to think about that. You need to be thinking about that because I can tell you're interested and get other people interested in it because... Yes, I've talked basically about some of the close-in things that we have to consider. There are so many other things we need to consider. Again, in the Air Force and the Navy and in, in, in the Marine Corps, I mean, the Marines, the whole Marine doctrine of what they're doing in the Pacific, they have a huge issue there of how they're going to supply people. We have the same problem. Our logistics system, which is another briefing, is a, is a major problem. How are we going to supply our forces with the ammunition we need when we can't mass stuff and make a Costco out of it, you know? I mean, the last time I was at the NTC, they had the ammo over here, and they had the fuel over here, and the water over here, and all this is within a football field, and it's all gonna go away. And then what are you gonna do? And where are you gonna get it from? So how do we, 
spread that out? How do we harden it? How do we get it anywhere? Can we resupply by drone? How do we medevac? We're not going to get helicopters into the battle space like we do now. How are you going to medevac people out? This idea that we're going to have deep penetrations with helicopters behind enemy lines, good luck on that. I mean, we've really got to have very special circumstances for that to work and some real focused effort. I didn't say it couldn't be done. I'm just saying it'll be extraordinary. And for what? What gain? It better be a big gain because it's going to be an extraordinary effort to clear a corridor to where helicopters are not knocked from the sky. Go back to uh, the Ukrainian war. Look at the Russian seizure of Hostomel Airport and, and, and they're fighting there. Interesting with an air mobile operation and that, wasn't, that was pretty deep for them. And that was, uh, they, they, they totally lost that one. They won initially and then lost. So we've got to think through a lot of things but getting there is a huge fight. Because wherever we are, we're not fighting in Wyoming, I don't think, I hope not. And we've got to figure out how to uh, get, get, us, get our forces there. And right now we don't have the shipping to get it there fast. And if you started to do war planning with this, you would see that there's a huge gap. Now we need to do that war planning. We need to bring those gaps up and we need to figure out how to fix them. But the other thing is, is we need to know how we're going to do logistics and how we're going to operate just in the battle space with what we've got. So forward deployment is what we try to do in Europe. There's some forward deployment now in the Pacific with forces in, in the Philippines and other places, but not in great numbers. Good question. Next question. There was one over here. Yes, sir. Oh, well, fratricide is going to be a big issue with uh, robots and artificial intelligence-driven systems, um, but probably not any bigger than in real life. Than, I mean, correction, that is real life. Uh, not any bigger than with human-operated systems. Um, it's hard to say. You know, there's an argument for the artificial intelligence systems will be smart enough not to make that mistake. I don't believe that. Uh, but what we have to do in every case is not consider it black and white, not a one or zero. Okay, we have to think about it as a hybrid. We're not going to have just machines running around. It's going to be a hybrid operation. Humans and machines, a centaur approach. And the whole idea of, of enabling the best in human beings with, with the, with the fast-making, uh, decision-making, and sorting of machines is what we need to combine. Now, I'm not saying that we make a human-machine hybrid, okay? although that's, that's something for planetary exploration. That's another story. But what we do need to do is we need to think about, we need to think about how we can make sure that we have human decision making involved where we need to and then release the machines where we need to. And in some cases, the biggest problem will be combatants, non-combatants. Because in many of these uh, armies that we fight, it will be very difficult to tell the difference. And so it will be a challenge. But in World War II, we had the same problem. And it was bloody and messy and it was a world war. So, you know, if we're fighting a very small contingency operation somewhere and we got plenty of time and we're the biggest bear in the planet or biggest bear in the area and we, nobody can hurt us, that's one thing. If we're fighting for our lives, that's another thing. So, difficult question to answer definitively. But thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Sir. Okay, that's a great question, and there's no easy answer to that. There is no, for instance, I think you should buy, you know, a battle command, battle space version, you know, 1.5, and it'll solve all your problems. That ain't going to happen. But you have the almost unlimited computer available to you in the history of the world, and that's your brain. So what you have to do is put it together. So, for instance, start off with a, a simple thing like, 
what does the common operational picture in our unit need to look like? What are the elements that we need for a common operational picture? What do we really need to know at all the different levels and how do they cascade to each other so that we can send that information down a little less, with, with a little less friction and a lot more seamlessly? How can we do that? I mean, if we had a common operational picture that worked at the company, at the battalion, and the brigade, and the division level, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? And then if it got to be an all-domain common operational picture, wouldn't that be exciting? Now, there's going to be software like JADC2, some of you may know what that is, and other things that are coming out. And of course, it's going to take a while for all those things to be there. And there are systems that we have that we need to maximize, but you're going to have to think through that and see with what you got. You know, learn what, first of all, learn the systems that you have. Don't be in a situation where only Specialist Smith knows how to use it. Everybody needs to know how to use it and then train on it. Again, don't, don't think that you'll rise to the level of your expectations. You will fall to the level of your training. So increase the training level in all those things. Figure it out mentally first and then drive for those systems. There are systems out there. I showed Sam's just recently a system the, uh, that Elbit Systems makes called TorchX. It helps in, in automated decision making and some other things. TorchX is interesting. You can go online and look at it. It might be something for you to give you ideas. I'm not saying go out and buy it. I'm not saying we're going to get it. The British Army is probably going to buy it, which is interesting. Uh, maybe then the Australians. Who knows? But the point is, is that, is that the, they're, they're on the cutting edge of how to use AI to support human decision making. Uh, and we need to be thinking about that as well. And we have very smart people that can do this. We just have to get drive the drive the requirement, drive the need. You know, all, a lot of you sit back and say, well, they're not giving me what I need. You've got to demand certain things. And if you keep demanding them, you might get better. They might get better at getting you what you need. Um, McClellan Saddle. McClellan Saddle, remember that. George B. McClellan. Not only was he a Union general of some repute, sometimes ill repute, depending on how you think about him. But for those of you that know anything about the Civil War, but also he created a saddle that in 1859, the US Army decided to buy and use for all of its horses. And it was a fine saddle. I mean, this is a damn good saddle. In fact, you still buy McClellan saddles today for those people who are very distinguished in riding their horses. It's not a sort of cowboy saddle. It's a really good saddle. Okay, so we kept the McClellan saddle in the Army for a long time. And we kept improving it and improving that McClellan saddle. And in 1943, we had a movie at Fort Knox on how the McClellan saddle and the cavalry was going to win the war in 1943. No kidding. You can go on YouTube and you can get the video. Now, we have to start thinking differently. We have to start thinking about what the future is going to look like and backward plan from there. We've got to use our brains. We've got to start doing war gaming. We've got to start using red teaming. And the more that we can do this, the faster we can get ahead of the curve and gain that foresight. And foresight is the ability to solve problems in the short term and create solutions for the long run. We desperately need leaders with foresight. You've had enough. My name is John Antel. My purpose in life is to develop leaders and inspire service. Thank you.